Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 1. Psalm 1. The Psalms are right in the middle of your Bibles. If you have one, you can pretty much find them by going right to the middle. Um, We're starting a new series this morning. Like I said, we're going to be looking at the first six of these Psalms. And the Psalms are really God's gift, one of God's greatest gifts to the church, because they were, uh, in their historical setting, Israel's songbook, their prayer book. Uh, They expressed the full range of human emotions, and they did that for them, and they do that for us, showing us how we can come to God in all seasons and in all circumstances to be able to express our heart to God, sometimes in extremely raw honesty. We see God working with his people to bring healing, to bring hope, through the Psalms. Now, there is a little bit of a shift. Uh, What we'll see in the Psalms is uh, one of the different genres of uh, the Bible. Uh, Genres are just different styles of writing. We've most recently been studying and looking at Paul's letter uh, to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. That's where we were the uh, almost the entire spring and into the summer. And that's what, uh, you know, what the English people would call prose writing. Uh, You know, just straight up, kind of straight writing, uh, very straightforward, very direct uh, kind of writing, saying uh, exactly what uh, you want someone to understand and trying to do it in as straightforward a way as possible. Uh, The Psalms are poetry, and by their very nature, that means that sometimes they say things in more flowery ways. They use metaphor and analogy and simile and contrast and literary device to be able to convey points. It's a little bit of a different genre. And Hebrew poetry, even uh, there, is different because you might look at the Psalms, especially as we read it and say, it doesn't sound like poetry to, to me. That's because poetry is different in, in English. I mean, we're used to English poetry with, you know, rhymes, similar sounds at the end of every line that sort of match together, where the, the number of syllables in the line kind of match with the number of syllables in the next line, and it all kind of matches in a neat meter, right? Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. See, similar syllables in each line, ends of the lines that that rhyme. It's how we do our English hymns as well. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. See, rhyme, meter. But Hebrew poetry is different. And it's actually very good that it is different because because it would be much harder to translate into English to be able to convey the thoughts if it rhymed in the same kind of way in Hebrew as we expect rhyme to happen in English. Uh, Actually, though, Hebrew poetry does rhyme. It just rhymes differently. We'll see this as we read the Psalms over the next couple of weeks. Hebrew poetry rhymes with, with parallelism. It's the repetition of an idea from line to line. It'll say one thing, and then it'll say almost the same thing in the next line. It'll just use different words to do it. It's rhyming. It's rhyming with parallel statements. Sometimes it's three lines. Sometimes it's contrasts as opposed to A and A1. It's A and B. They're different, but they match together as opposite sides of the same coin. So Hebrew poetry is indeed poetry, and it does rhyme. It just rhymes a little bit differently. 150 psalms in the five books of the Psalter, and we're going to start with Psalm 1. Most, Most scholars refer to Psalm 1 as the preface psalm the gateway into the Psalms. Charles Spurgeon, the great English Baptist preacher, said this is the text, Psalm 1, upon which the whole of the Psalms make up one divine sermon. So here's the introduction to the the sermon. We're going to read Psalm 1. If you're able, let me invite you to stand as we do that. And then when I'm finished, I'm going to make the declaration that this is the word of the Lord and invite you to respond by saying thanks be to God. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruits in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Now, this word that starts the psalm, blessed, is a word that church people use all the time. How you doing? I'm blessed, right? Bless you. We use that word all the time. But even if we don't understand completely what 
blessed means in a biblical context, we probably know enough to say, hey, if I want to be blessed or not blessed, which are you going to choose? I'm going to choose blessed. Right? After all, the opposite of blessed is cursed, and who would want to be that? You want to be blessed if you have a, have a choice. And like I said, this psalm starts with that phrase, blessed is the man, sits over top of the the whole psalm. That's what a Hebrew scholar uh, Mark Furtado points out, that if you look at the construction, this first phrase, blessed is the man, is really separate in a sense. It really hangs over the whole psalm. It sets the tone for what follows, and it says, this is what you want to be. You want to be the blessed man. And therefore, if it sits over top of the first psalm, and we already said that in a sense the first psalm sits over top of the entire book of psalms, then really this is the goal of the entire book of psalms to show us what it means to be blessed, how we're blessed, and what the blessed man is all about. Now, blessed, like I said, is a word that we use in English, but it's really hard to capture this Hebrew word that is translated blessed here. There's no Hebrew, no English word that kind of fully captures the equivalent. You can sort of get at it by saying it's blessed is like to be truly happy, right? Not just outwardly happy, not just like, you know, I'm good. No, but like truly happy, deeply happy, showered in God's favor. To be blessed is to be in a state of total well-being where you lack nothing, nothing at all. Now there again, if you look at it, you define it that way, you say, well, would you want to be that? Well, absolutely. Certainly want to be, want, would want to be that. Who wouldn't want to be that? The question is for us then is, okay, well, how do I be that? What does that look like? What does it mean to be blessed in that way? How do we get there. There's only two ways for us to go in life, only two, two paths ultimately. We see that actually repeated over and over again throughout culture, throughout literature. We see that idea of two paths and only two. Classic of American cinema, 1979, the Muppet movie. We're seeing the Muppet movie. It's an absolute classic. Kermit and Fozzie, they're on their way to Hollywood become rich and famous. Kermit the Frog and Fozzie the Bear, of course. They're driving, I think it was Fozzie's Uncle Studebaker or something like that. They're trying to navigate their way to Hollywood. This is before GPS, and so Kermit's got the map. Fozzie's at the wheel. Kermit's looking at the map. He's navigating, and he tells Fozzie to turn left at the fork, the fork in the road. They're driving along, and to their shock, they see they're stuck in the road, a giant nine-foot-high fork stuck in the road, right where it divides. Big, giant kitchen utensil right there in the middle of the road. That's what we have when we come to Psalm 1 here. It's a big giant utensil right in the middle of our road, forcing us to go or to look one way or the other. The Muppet movie. Now, a little more cultural, a little more sophisticated example, if you turn your face up uh, up at that. How about Robert Frost, the great American poet, early 20th century? You remember the poem, probably, even if you're not a big poetry fan, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood, he wrote. And sorry, I could not travel both and be one traveler long I stood And I looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. There he is, standing, looking down two paths, wondering which way to choose, trying to peer as far as he could down each of them to say, is is this the way I want to go or is this the way I want to go? Psalm 1 helps us to look down the path. It doesn't have to be a guess. Robert Frost, he's standing at at the fork in the road, the big giant kitchen utensil sitting there and he's kind of wondering what's down this way and what's down that and which way do I want to go. Psalm 1 doesn't leave us with any ambiguity. It tells us which way to go. Now we do have to choose. Some people try to do both or at least they wish they could do both. You might remember Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz. She's gone down the yellow brick road. She wants to go to Oz. It's how she's going to get home. It's how she's going to be rescued. And she comes to a fork in the road. She's told to follow the yellow brick road, but she gets to a place where it divides. Now, right in the middle of the divide, of course, is the scarecrow hanging on a post. And as she gets there, she says to her dog, Toto, she says, now which way do we go? And the scarecrow, who's hanging on the pole, says, well, this is a very nice way. And he points one way. And then he says, well, it's also pleasant down that way as well. And he points the other direction. And then, uh, seemingly, completely unable to make up his mind, he doesn't have one, remember, he says, of course, there are people do go both ways. Now, that's a logical impossibility to go both ways at the same time, but the scarecrow, of course, without a brain, he can't do logic very well. But can you? Can you go both ways? Maybe we give the scarecrow a little more credit. Maybe he's not saying that a person, one person, can be on both roads at the same time. Maybe he's saying it just doesn't matter which way you go. 
You can go one way or the other. You can go both ways. Either would be the better word, but he just said both. Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll's novel, one day Alice came to a fork in the road and she saw the Cheshire cat in a tree. Which road do I take, she asked. Where do you want to go, was his response. I don't know, Alice answered. Then, said the cat, it doesn't matter. You need to know where you're going. And you can only go one way. Psalm 1 helps us with that. It matters which way you choose. And there's a theme that the Bible puts in front of us. Right? This is in the Bible too. Not just in literature, not just in popular culture. Adam and Eve faced a choice. Obey God or not obey God. It was really that simple. Tree or not the tree. Joshua leading the people into the promised land. Choose this day whom you will serve. Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, I've set before you life and death. Two things, two ways, blessing and curse. Therefore choose life, he said, that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice, and holding fast to him. That's Psalm 1. That's what Psalm 1's telling us right there. Now here's the summary. I was uh, interacting with someone a couple weeks ago, um, and they had someone come up to them uh, later on Sunday and said, hey, uh, how was church today? Just small cut talk kind of thing. And they said, uh, uh, how, was the, how was the sermon? What was the sermon about? Uh, and they froze. I don't remember. Now, I can relate to that, just so you know, right, to make you feel better. I've had that happen to me. I'm preaching. I've had someone ask me on the Sunday afternoon, and it's just, you know, and it's just like, oh, wait, hold on. Let me stick it. All right. This is why I give you the summary, though. Right? All you have to do is memorize this. Right? Someone comes up to you later and says, you know, what was, what was the sermon about today? Just give them the summary. There are only two ways to live. See it there? All you, if you don't remember anything, there's only two ways to live. To know and to love God is the only one that will lead to eternal blessing. That's what the sermon's about. Now, three questions that'll help us think it through as we go through. Right? First question, where are you rooted? Where is your fruit? And what is your destiny? All right, that'll help us with the, with the two ways, the two ways that we can be. Let's talk about being rooted first. Now, I know, I, admittedly, we're kind of switching the metaphor from travel to plant life. Um, but bear with me because it's still the same concept, the same idea of, of two ways. There's only two ways to be. Now, interestingly enough, you look at Psalm 1 here, it really starts with the negative. I mean, it says blessed is the man, but that's kind of the heading. And then it kind of goes to the negative immediately. Now, there's some good reasons to start by the contrast. What's not blessed look like? Well, one reason might be is it's actually something that we can relate to. It resembles us a little bit better <laughs> than the positive. We can look at the negative and say, walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Wait, walking in the counsel of the wicked. Okay, I, I can actually kind of think through that a little bit. Stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. Those three things is where he starts. Negative, a blessed man is not this. That's often actually a better way to define something. You can say something is this, is this, is this, but if you just keep saying what it is, then you almost get this sense that it almost could be anything. It's only when you say what it's not that you put boundaries and limits around it. And so the best way to start defining what a blessed person is is to maybe start saying what a blessed person is not. And blessed here is contrasted with these three words, wicked, sinners, scoffers. Uh, wicked, some uh, people have pointed out, um, is actually maybe better thought of as ungodly. It's closer to the Hebrew, some of the, uh, some of the commentators have, have kind of pointed out. And it's really, uh, it's really just because of uh, the English connotation, wicked, right? Speaking of Wizard of Oz, like we think of the Wicked Witch. Like we think of like absolute, like just like this small segment of really, really bad people when we think of that word. Ungodly really helps us with the idea of two different ways though. Because there you can only be two different things. You can be godly or ungodly, right? Two ways. And that's what, that's what Psalm 1 is saying here, right? Sits not, walks not in the counsel of the wicked. That means that you listen. You entertain what the, what the wicked are saying. It means that you kind of ponder that. You consider that. You take your cues from that. It becomes what you draw on to be able to decide what to do and how to, to live in your life those who are ungodly, those who do not have the things of God at the center of their lives. And if that is your root, well then Psalm 1 is saying that you're going to be headed in the wrong direction, you're going to be in the wrong way. And you go into the next one, right? Standing in the way of sinners, and then to the next one, sitting in the seat of scoffers. 
right? Some people have, some of the commentators have kind of said that like, now there really isn't a logical pro progression here. I think it's hard not to see a logical progression here. You kind of go from one to the other to the other, kind of spirals down almost. You go from thinking to just kind of considering, you know, walking in the counsel of the wicked, right? You entertain the thoughts, and you, that's interesting, to actually acting, standing in the way of sinners. You're, you're now one of them yourself. You're a, you're a sinner. You're standing in the way of the, of the sinners to sitting in the seat of scoffers. Now you become not just someone who listens to that which is ungodly, not, which, not just practices that which is ungodly, but now you're on the other side actually promoting that which is ungodly. There is a progression here. Now that's contrasted with the blessed man, like I said. What's the, what's the root for this way? Well, the metaphor, the, the, the simile at the beginning of verse 3 gives us a, a picture, a mental picture of what the, the blessed man is like. He's like a tree planted by streams of living water, a tree that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Now that image is, it's, it's simple enough. A blessed tree is one that has a constant supply of water, not one that's dependent upon the variability of the weather. It's, it's planted, it's, it's fixed, it's next to a stream. So it doesn't matter what the external circumstances are doing, it doesn't matter if it's rain or drought, because the water supply is there, it's planted in the right place, it has a constant supply. This represents the follower of God. It already tells us in verse 2 what it means to be planted. The planted by stream, a tree planted by streams of water is just the metaphor that shows us what verse 2 is, right? The righteous man. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Right? This is what we root ourselves in. This is what we drink. This is the water that we're, that we're, we're planted in. The water supply is the law of God. Now, when the Psalms use this phrase here, the law, it's not just referring to the Ten Commandments in some kind of narrow sense. It's all of God's instruction, the covenant that he makes with his people. It's understanding and rooting and, and knowing God's law, but not just knowing it, actually knowing it with delight, wanting to know it, desiring to know it. Does that strike you as odd? I mean, the law is something that you obey, but to love it, to desire it, C.S. Lewis found it a little bit odd at first. In his book, The Reflections on the Psalms, he kind of goes through and said, he said, I can kind of picture, you know, respecting the law, appreciating the law, but at first he said, the idea of delighting in the law was something that escaped me. And he thought more about it, though, and he realized, he said, no, actually, you can. He said he knew scholars in different disciplines that loved the thing that they studied, didn't just respect it, didn't just appreciate the subject that they were studying, they actually loved the subject. But then further than that, when you come to the Psalms, when you come to the law of God, the idea, the repetition over and over again of not just obeying the law, but loving the law, he said began to make more sense because if we understand it as delighting in not just the law, but delighting in the law of God, then we realize that meditating on his word, learning what it says, understanding what it means, actually is a pathway and a doorway to knowing and understanding the God who wrote it. No, that's a little bit different. If you want to get to know God, you know him through his law. And then all of a sudden, what he's written becomes not just something to appreciate, it becomes something to delight in. When Stacy and I first started getting to know each other, my wife, we wrote letters to one another. And these letters were were precious because when you read the letter, you, you didn't open it up and you say, wow, this is really, oh, that's really interesting the way that she phrased that sentence, right? That yeah, was really interesting how she built this paragraph upon that paragraph. We can do that with the law of God and it's not inappropriate. It's good to have good structure to your writing. But when I looked at Stacy's letters, it wasn't the letter itself, the words there that I was appreciating as much as the opportunity that it gave me to know the one behind the words. That's what delighting in the law of God means. It's not just appreciating the outward characteristics of the text. It's knowing the one who wrote it and the window that it gives us into his character. There's only two ways. You're either rooted in the lies that you're told by those who are in rebellion against God, the ungodly, or you're rooted in the revelation of the character and the identity of God. And what you're rooted in then determines, determines what your fruit is, what the outward expression is, what that looks like on the outside. Again, only two ways, only two outcomes. 
For the one who's planted in the law of God, the fruit results in, in, in prosperity. Right? Perhaps external prosperity in certain cases, but definitely internal prosperity. That's the blessedness that we were talking about. Contentment, value, productivity. Right? The whole idea of, of fruit, right? Yields a tree that yields its fruit in season. That's what it's, that's what it's talking about right there. What's fruit? coming off of a plant, coming off of a tree. Different than a leaf. Fruit is productive. A fruit contains the seeds for new life. A fruit is where the nutrients are. A fruit sustains and, and encourages and multiplies life. Now for the wicked though, when the plant grows in the wrong rooted place, the result isn't valuable reproductive fruit that brings life. It's useless chaff. Now chaff is a word that we don't often use it's the husk of the of the grain right so if you had wheat for example or corn the husk is what's on the outside right just think fourth of july right july we're husking corn that's what it is it's the outward part but with grain the fruit and the you know the, the actual grain and the husk were smaller what they would do is they would lay out all the grain as they harvested it from the field and they would usually try to do it in a place that had a little bit of elevation and they would use animals or they would beat the grain with sticks or big mallets and they would try to break up the chaff from the grain that was on the inside and then what they would do with big forks or shovels is they would kind of throw it in the air hopefully on a really breezy day the grain would be heavy enough to fall to the ground the husk would blow away the chaff that's what the image is here what blows away is not productive what blows away is useless that's kind of a sobering uncomfortable kind of way to think about it isn't it I mean, it's one thing to be called wrong. It's another thing to be called useless. Absolutely without productivity at all. But that's exactly what the fruit of the ungodly is. That's what happens. It doesn't last. It's forgotten. It's futile. It's as if you just were there and then gone. Have you ever imagined diving into the water or falling into the ocean? You displace the water for a very brief second, but then after that, the ocean shows no evidence that you were there at all for any length of time. Completely gone. That's the image that this chaff is. Blown away, gone, useless, and quickly forgotten. Only two ways that result and logically fr flow from where you're rooted. Valuable life-giving fruit or useless chaff and husks. And that leads you to where you're going. Remember the Cheshire cat said you need to know that. Robert Frost was trying to figure it out which path he should go on. This is where you're going. This is where the fruit leads. Again, there's only two ways, only two destinies, only two results. Look at the Hebrew poetry. Paired thoughts on multiple lines. See it, verses 5 and 6. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And you see the contrast, right? The wicked, the sinners, they're not going to stand in the judgment. They won't be able to survive it. But the blessed, they'll stand. The wicked will not be counted among the righteous. But the blessed will enter into the congregation of the holy ones. The way of the righteous is known. It's understood. The way of the wicked, like chaff, perish. It, it, when it says that the ways of the righteous are known, it's more than just God knows them, like knows about them. He knows everything. This is the idea of intimacy. God knows the righteous. The righteous are seen. They're heard. The ultimate judgment is to be forgotten. That's where we're going. One of those two places and there's only two. Now what do we do? <laughs> I mean, what, do we, what do we do with all this? What is Psalm 1 trying to tell us? How do we respond to it? How do we react? Jesus picked up the theme, you know, of two ways in his teaching. He did it a number of times. Two foundations for different houses, two different kinds of trees, talked about fruit, he talked about wheat and chaff. But most importantly, towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he told everyone the contrast in the ways. He says this, he says, enter by the narrow gate, for that gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, right? The wide gate, it's easy, it's wide. The narrow gate though, that's what you want to go through. He said the ones who enter through the the easy way, those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to eternal life and those who find it are few. 
See the contrast that he's making? Two ways, two gates. One's wide, popular, easy, comfortable. The other is narrow, less traveled, hard, but it's actually the one that you want. Robert Frost again, this is how he ended his poem. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. The one less traveled, the harder way. But how? How do we go the harder way? We go the harder way because of Jesus. That's why he brings up the narrow and the, and the wide. Right? Now, the danger in the Psalms, as we interpret the Psalms, is seeing Jesus in absolutely everything. We can't assume that the psalmist knew about this historical figure and all the detail that's ultimately revealed about him. There are messianic psalms. There are psalms that speak specifically of a Messiah who is to come. We'll see some of that in Psalm 2 next week. So there is a danger of overseeing Jesus in everything. But make no mistake about it, Jesus is here. He is the end and the subject of every single psalm. Harry Ironside, an American evangelist in the early 20th century, he tells a story. Uh, We prayed earlier for Tracy and for Joy serving churches in the Middle East. Well, Harry Ironside told the story of a, uh, of a man, Joseph Flax. This is before the establishment of the Jewish state in the middle of the 20th century. But Joseph Flax was there in Palestine. He was doing an evangelism event. He had the opportunity to speak to a gathering of men and women who were from both Jewish and Arab backgrounds. And he, and he did so on the basis of the first psalm. He read the psalm. He started at the beginning. And then he asked a question. He said, oh, let's have a discussion about this. And he said, who is the man about whom this psalm is writing. And it was a great pause, right? Blessed is the man. And so he prompts them. He says, maybe Abraham, the father of the faithful, Abraham, right? Whether you're from a Jewish or an Arab background, you would have recognized Abraham as a great man, father of the, of the faith. And from the back, an aged Jewish gentleman stands up and he says, no, it couldn't have been Abraham. Abraham listened to evil counsel. Remember, counsel of his own heart. He There was the occasion where he lied about his wife to Pharaoh in order to save his own skin. It couldn't have been Abraham. So Flax said, all right, maybe uh, Moses, the giver of the law, the great great Moses. Another gentleman stood up and he said, no, it couldn't have been Moses. Moses was a murderer, remember? He killed an Egyptian, hid the body in the sand, wasn't able to control his anger. Same anger that flared in the desert, contrary to God's command and wasn't allowed to enter the promised land because of it. Couldn't have been Moses. What about David? Flax asked. No, couldn't have been David, right? And they reasoned rightly. David committed adultery with Bathsheba, had her husband murdered in order to cover up the adultery. Couldn't have been David. Well, then asked Flax about, about who, whom, who could the psalmist possibly be writing? And at this point, someone in the back stood up and he said, he said, I'm not really sure of this. And I don't know that I'm personally ready to answer along these lines, but I have this little book and I've been reading it. It's called the New Testament, it says here. And from what I read here about an outstanding man, I would be inclined to think that the man about whom the psalmist is writing is Jesus of Nazareth. Because he didn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. He didn't stand in the way of sinners. He didn't sit in the seat of mockers. That's right. Go back to verse 1. Blessed is the man. In Hebrew, it's haish. Jesus is the man. The only true righteous, godly man. Well, good for him, you might say. He gets, to, he, he gets to sit among the righteous. He gets to sit in the congregation of the blessed. Good for him. What about me? If we've just established that Jesus is that only righteous man, then how in the world can I get in the place? How can I be on the right way? What about us? Well, there's more to what we know about Jesus, isn't there? He didn't just live the righteous life. He died the death of the ungodly. Jesus knows this way too. When Jesus carried the cross on his shoulders to Jerusalem, he walked the way of the wicked. He literally walked along the road for the condemned man. He walked the way in their place. When Jesus stood before the Roman governor, when he stood before the Jewish authorities, he stood in the way of sinners, in their place, on trial for crimes he didn't commit. And as Jesus hung on the cross, and as the Jewish leaders, and as the Roman soldiers looked at him and mocked and scoffed, he placed himself in the midst of the scoffers, 
enduring the taunts in order to accomplish his mission. It's just like the hymn goes. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. That's the gospel. Jesus lived the righteous life of the blessed man that I should have lived, and he died the death of the criminal and the ungodly in my place. That seals our pardon. So the two ways are in front of us. What do we do? Well, first, don't go all the way to the extreme and think that you're smart enough, think that you're good enough to figure it out on your own. A tree doesn't plant itself, after all. A tree is planted. And if you're at all resonating with anything that we've been talking about, in fact, if you're here this morning, then I can, I think, with all authority say that you are being put and planted in that water. You're in the soil, the rich streams. So drink of the water. Put your trust and your faith in that man, in the perfect man, in the man, in the blessed man. That's what you do. And second, this is really important, don't put it off. There's only two ways. Don't put off thinking it through. This is a world that's violent. It's a world where things can change really, really rapidly, and you aren't guaranteed even this afternoon. I was reading this past week, it caught my eye probably because some of you know we're going to be Going to Cooperstown, one of my sons is playing in a baseball tournament for 12-year-olds that they do in Cooperstown. All throughout the summer, you spend a week there and the kids stay in dormitories and they play lots of baseball games. Well, it caught my eye because of that, a story in the news. The Van Epps family, suburban Atlanta family, two weeks ago, Father Ryan, Mother Laura, two sons, Harrison, 10, and James J.R., they called him, who's 12. He was the baseball player at Cooperstown. They were there the last week in June. Sunday, June 30th, Ryan pitched the last game of the tournament. They lost, but he pitched well. Game over, everybody fist bumped, said goodbye, see you back in Atlanta. They were flying home with their grandfather, pilot, six feet, single engine plane, good pilot. By all accounts, the plane was in good condition, all the maintenance done, but it hit weather, crashed over the Catskills. Friday was Friday afternoon. All six killed. Not about the safety of flying versus not flying. It's not to get us overly anxious about traveling or doing things. It's not about planes. It's not about baseball. It's not about the things that we do. It's about the brevity of life. We do not know what this afternoon will hold. Two ways in front of us. There are only two. One leads to eternal blessing. And only one is available to us because of what Jesus has done. Let's pray. Father, we come to you humbly, recognizing that as we read this psalm, we are the ungodly, we are the sinner, we are the scoffer. We want to be the hero, we want to be the righteous, we want to be the blessed. And the great hope, the great truth of the gospel is We can be. As your people, we are. Because of the one blessed man, Jesus Christ. And so we fall at your feet. We thank you for your grace. And Lord, I pray that no one would leave here today without knowing that hope, knowing that truth, being firmly planted in the streams of living water with the hope of eternal life. Lord, bless us. Bless us as a people to be able to proclaim this hope to a world that struggles, to a world in chaos, to a world that so desperately needs the hope that only Jesus can offer. For we pray in his name. Amen.